New York City, the most crowded city in the United States, from its founding has struggled with the relationship between density, economic growth, and public health. On Wall Street, with the flow of capital, comes the creation of wealth. Old New York, continually reinventing itself, has strived to turn its wealth into meaningful prosperity for all. And despite New York's ups and downs throughout history, it was the first metropolis in the United States to create progressive policies to protect the health and welfare of the general public. As the old aphorism goes, public health is public wealth. And by public wealth, we mean that which is dependent on urban density. It cannot be credibly argued that large cities anywhere in the world, not just New York, ever plan for shrinking in size based on health considerations. Today, as during the epidemics that scourged New York in the 19th century, those most affected are also those most essential to the functioning of the economy. Also revived is the question of the efficacy of social distancing and the effect it might have on the future of cities and of urban density in general. Some urban planners are left wondering to what degree urban density should be reduced in order to protect residents from contagious diseases. And we see a revival of questions related to equity of response across the population and its relationship to the city's economy. This video highlights findings in the brief paper entitled Density, Equity, and the History of Epidemics in New York City by Richard Plonce and Andres Alvarez Davila under the banner of the Earth Institute at Columbia University. This video explains four main topics. One, question of density and health. Two, mortality as a health metric. Three, health and spatial fabric. And four, a density question. The question of density and health. A definitive treatise on the relationship between density and health was first published in 1866. The groundbreaking report upon the sanitary condition of the city was sponsored by the Citizens Association, a private group that sought to ameliorate environmental conditions with an eye to maintaining the city's competitive business edge. It was an exhaustive survey of 29 sanitary districts in the city that explored correlations between disease and the spatial morphology of the urban fabric. Like today, the question of distancing was addressed, defined as required volumes of air needed to provide safe conditions. Mortality is health metric. By 1866, an important metric was the rate of mortality in New York that had been recorded sporadically relative to the most important scourges. On the surface, the rate had drastically declined since the 1702 yellow fever epidemic, yet it was nearly double that of London or Philadelphia. Although vital statistics for the first 60 years of the 19th century are not comprehensive by modern standards, Beginning around 1860, mortality records show that tuberculosis was the leading cause of death, and general mortality was on the rise in New York, especially among the age group under 20 years of age. After 1825, the only disease to disrupt the city to the degree of earlier epidemics was cholera, which first spread to Europe and America in the early 19th century when urban conditions were ripe for the disease's propagation. Cholera swept through New York in 1832, 1849, and 1866, killing thousands of New Yorkers and infecting thousands more. During the cholera years of 1830s and 1850s, mortality rates soared to heights almost double of those at the beginning of the century and over quadruple at current levels killing approximately 1 in 20 persons. Typhus became virtually endemic to the city's slums and associated with the poor, a situation aggravated by the influx of immigrants crowded in the city's tenements. Health and spatial fabric. 
Three decades of data linking the city's worsening health conditions and the spatial fabric of the city had, by 1866, proven to be incontrovertible. Scientific studies relating worsening living conditions, proximity, and health proliferated. Most exhaustive and influential was the work of John H. Griscom, a physician who, in 1842, was appointed as city inspector and began a long and significant initiative on public health in New York that clarified the relationship between social class and disease vulnerability. In his treatise, The Uses and Abuses of Air, 1854, he researched the importance of light and air in addressing hygiene and housing, and he was among the first to propose spatial metrics for the amount of air per person in order to overcome the negative consequences of high densities. In fact, his studies anticipated the current research of the spatial distancing required to mitigate the spread of COVID-19. Unsanitary water supply had already been identified as an early culprit, especially for yellow fever and cholera. In 1835, more than a decade before, construction on the Croton Aqueduct had begun in order to provide sanitary public source of drinking water, as well as provide for the growing requirements of New York City's industrial sector. But after its completion in 1845, the differential between rich and poor only increased, with the decreased use of wells raising the water table, leaving the cellar dwellers in damper and more hazardous conditions. Although the 1866 report exhaustively showed the immediacy of the situation, governmental response was slow, amounting to only tentative recognition of the problem in the following year with the first Tenement House Act. While the act attempted to address public health considerations in housing for the poor, its provisions were cursory, mostly visibly requiring the ubiquitous fire escapes that characterize many of New York's old tenement law buildings. Only in 1879, the first comprehensive law related to housing form and health finally passed with the invention of the so-called dumbbell tenements, which ensured each household access to a narrow, dumbbell-shaped air shaft. This breakthrough codified a repetitive housing fabric relative to prior informal spatial typologies. It solved the dilemma of increased density, while at the same time produced a modicum of sanitary conditions. Thus, by 1900, some 60,000 such tenements were built. The inevitable question now becomes, what is the same and what has changed today? During the 19th century, medical science had yet to find cures to many of the diseases that plagued New York, a situation that is echoed by the current lack of vaccines for COVID-19. Despite advances in medicine and demographic changes, one thing remains the same. The nexus between social class and disease and the excessive vulnerability of poor populations and people of color. The connection between housing and disease remains as relevant today as it was then, although our capacity to address the housing question has fundamentally changed. In response to the public health crisis of the 19th century, there were 60,000 old law tenement buildings constructed between 1879 and 1901, the product of an economic context that had the capacity to produce affordable housing to scale. After numerous attempts, the economics of housing production in New York City today shows no signs of capacity to adapt and the present health crisis demonstrates exactly the consequences of this inability. Today, for example, the high concentration of COVID-19 in the River Park Towers in the Bronx would be entirely consistent with the well-documented fever nests of 150 years ago, now echoed by the so-called death towers in the poorest congressional district in the nation. When the consequences of the city's inability to properly deal 
with the affordable housing crisis and the push and pull between public health and economic interests have come into stark relief, now is the time for New York City to ask the question, is public health truly public wealth?